She's a Jersey cow and therefore agreeable, adorable, and gives milk that is rich, nourishing, and sweeter than any cow's milk. With talent and patience, you can team up with nature and make that milk into incomparable cheese. That's next on Chef's Afield. Philosophy in action. Odessa Piper was a young woman on the move, hitchhiking to see America, when in the hippie days of yore, she thumbed a ride with some back to the land folks. Odessa Piper has in her way been on the land ever since, serving local and seasonal specialties from the farms near L'Etoile, her famous restaurant in Madison, Wisconsin. Mary Fox says her love tree farm is so far out in the woods of Wisconsin that, quote, nobody knows we're here. Mary Falk and her husband, Dave, make cheese by hand, make cheese just the way it was made by the first humans ever to figure out the process. It's so subtle. It's so patient. It's so thoughtful. And, and there's so much detail. It, I just, you don't necessarily know that when you sit down and eat a great piece of cheese, the story that is behind it. It begins in the grass, in the wholesome nourishment of pasture that has not been hit with pesticides. Its key is the gentle Jersey with milk so sweet, you could sing about it. Grant Burdick has his cows and his good hands. That's about all he needs. He does not have and doesn't need the ordinary factory-like system of pipes and tubes and vats that move milk around and smash it, breaking down its proteins. Dairyman Burdick does one pour, just the one, husbanding the goodness of the milk. This whole system is a step back in time. Well, I know it's a really tough business. Very tough. It felt really tough when my alarm clock rang this morning come out here. Today, the chef is visiting. Odessa Piper comes to see the gentle jerseys, the small cows with the pleasant disposition, and the reputation for the sweetest milk. I've been loving the cheese that's coming right here from these cows. It's great inspiration to me. Good. These cows are so beautiful. They're so much smaller than Holsteins. They must produce less milk. Higher in, in butterfat and in solids. But they don't produce as much milk as the Holsteins, but it's, it's uh, richer. My cows get grass and a low, rather, input diet, and they're fed pure alfalfa and good quality stuff and really super feed. I just was curious, when you use the, the pump milker, uh, how do you know when, when the cow's done, when the... All right, feel her udder now. Excuse me, dear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When they get done, it'll feel soft. It'll feel like a rag. But big part of it is the fact that you do it every day seven days a week and you know the cows and you know how much they give and about. Yeah, you know, uh, that makes a lot of sense when we cook. You know, we just know when the fish is done or the meat is done, we just touch it. Right, It just, right. all you do is touch it and, and I think I understand. Thanks, I've always wanted to know that. If you want to put me to work, you let me know. <laughs> now, did you miss her? You, no, you can oh, do her. Oh, she's already. She's already, you can do her. Now look at that, she's moved her tail over so nicely. Can I try her? You gotta wipe her off first. You gave me the cow with the dirtiest teats. Did that on purpose. I used to milk when I was about 20 years old. You probably all and... remember when that came in dirty when it rained out and was muddy. She's got so much mud on her. She's getting the deluxe clean here. Okay, lady. Oh. Turn it all the way over, Odessa. Like this? Everything's got to be laid over. Oh, like that? Yeah, you start there. All right, okay. then you got to turn the valve on. Uh. Nope, you missed the quarter. Oh, man. Good job. This is one, this is one very forgiving cow. Right, well. Oh, man. 
did well. Well, she's a very patient lady. She's very she kind is, she's to a me. Good, she's a good milker. Cows are the best. At Love Tree Farm, Dave Falk is happy to pay the extra for good milk, for organic, natural, sweet, high-fat milk that is simply great for making cheese. How much do they weigh? Hey, Mary. Hey, Odessa. Woo. Good to see you. Hi, girlfriend. Dave's got you working already, I see. Yeah. So this milk is still like cow. Like body temperature like warm. body temperature. It's gold. This yes. stuff is liquid gold. This is really great stuff. Yeah, we saw that at the farm. We're going to see it again. Ready to dump? I'll show you what we do. Isn't that just beautiful? Yeah. Look how gold that is. The, yeah. the cream's coming to the top. Yeah. And that gold is caused by those cows out on the grass. And they get this high yeah. amount of keratin. Yeah, I can, I can actually see. The, the orange swirls. Yes. Oh. And only the jerseys do that. Oh, I can't yeah. wait for this cheese. Yep. But I have to wait months, don't I? <laughs> OK. Oh, it's not Watch it back. On the count of three, one, two, three. Whoa. Hot water comes in, circulates underneath the vat, oh, and heats it up like a yeah. bathtub. The key right now is to heat this milk as fast as possible. This is the most uh, precarious time for the milk. And what I'm doing is uh, making the milk hospitable to the bacteria that we want. The beneficial, yes, right. the desirable ones. Because it's a race. And what it is, is it's okay. a race of good bacteria against any possible bad bacteria. What are the, uh, the intentional bacteria that you start uh, so we're going to be using mesophilic. It's a family of bacteria. I'm going to be able to remember that name and spell it. Yeah. I know. Mesophilic is a terminology re uh, in uh, reference to quite a few different kinds of bacteria that thrive between uh, under 110 degrees. Your okay. thermophilic bacteria thrive and really proliferate over 110. And then uh, your bacteria basically die off after 120. And Mary, it's the it's the particular bacteria, the particular clan that will give a certain flavor one way or another. Yes. And their job is to eat the lactose, yeah. eat it, the it, sugar, okay. uh -huh. just like the yeast does. Okay. And then, but when they eat that sugar, they're kind of leaving a trail behind them of different flavors. Okay, so it's at the right temperature. You want me to stir this in, Mary? Yeah, just keep. We're going to stir this milk for two minutes. And what we're doing now is basically putting the culture in here. We're going to stir it in for two minutes so that these cultures can reawaken again. Now we're going to let it rest for a while. It's called the ripening time. Okay. And we're going to let those little critters in there alone. And they're going to just do their thing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to grab some cheese, go into the house, and get something to eat. <gasps> Great. Yes. Instead of putting cheese into plastic wrap, Mary has caves to put it in, modeled on caves in Spain tunneled into the Wisconsin hills, a web of cement and earthen walls where cheese can sit, often on cedar boughs for flavor, while the drying is done just right, and where mold can do its curing. So this is the caves, Odessa. I have to re go inside and turn the light on, so oh. it's kind of dark, so. There oh. we go, it's first light. Oh. Isn't that cool? Oh, here's the oh. second light. This is my version of heaven. <laughs> you poor soul. <laughs> oh, like Mary. See, now the reason we keep the cave dark is because the molds grow totally out of control if there's light in here all the time. Yeah, these are the trade like tango. You know, it takes two to tango, so these are a cow's milk and a sheep's milk blend. Ah, the two. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. And we wanted to kind of spice things up a little bit. So we balmed the cheeses in a rub made from Wisconsin grade A butter and ground sumac berries and tuttle cherry peppercorns. And you know, number one, I think a little bit of that flavor is going to permeate the rind and give a little bit of a zing. And we can eat that at yes. the end of it. Yes. yes, you'll be able to eat the rind. Uh, some people don't. Some people would like it, you know. But what it also does is this little bizarre mixture that's in the rub attracts different kinds of molds. Yeah, I see there's these beautiful molds growing on this. Yep. We have a geotrichum is the first mold. Yeah, how does the mold work on the cheese, Mary, for us uh, okay. civilians? For you, for you mold civilians, if you can think of the mold as something not to be afraid of, because cheese will not support pathogenic mold. That puts you in a proper frame of mind to look at molds. 
And then if you understand that they exist in a microscopic world, and if you think of the little part that you see out here, the colors, mm -hmm. and some cheeses that are older, you'll have about seven different colors on there, pinks and mm -hmm. blues and greens. Those are like little flowers. You see the little leaves and petals and flowerets. What they do is they put in microscopic roots through the middle of the cheese. You can't see this. This is not the blue mold at all. It's just microscopic little. Like little root tendrils, like, yes. like, like hair um, roots of a tree. Exactly. Uh, OK, this, this, I got yeah, it. I've okay. seen it. I, I, I think of a more technical term, but we'll stay away from that. Anyhow, um, they, as they put those roots through, those roots feed the flower up on top, which is what you see as mold. OK. Ah. Uh, but that's, not what, that's just where it begins. The little flower, the mold, mm -hmm. sucks oxygen in from the outside into mm -hmm. the cheese. It pulls that into the cheese, and as it pulls it into the cheese, it imparts its own flavor to the cheese. It filters the air. So you have over 2,000 different molds that cheese will support the life of. You have over 2,000 different potential flavors, like compost. It's breathing. It's, it's breathing. breathing. It's breathing exhaling. oxygen, and then it's exhaling. Right, it's exha exhaling. Oh. Cheese puts out a lot of heat. Little tendril flowers yes. yep. with little tendril roots yep. and lots breathing of flavor. oxygen. Lots of flavor. This is where you get the complexity of flavor in artisan cheeses. The newest batch has been on the fire now for two hours. The chemical changes are on schedule. Keep the milk at just the right temperature and now do a lot more stirring. So the bacteria, desirable bacteria, have multiplied now and yes. established their clan. They've had a major big time party in here. So what are you adding there? Okay, this is the rennet. What's so, going to happen when you add the rennet? It's going to split proteins and things. We want, want Will it do it before our eyes? Uh, kind of. Do you want me to keep stirring? Keep stirring. OK. Now, normally it mixes 40 to 1 with water, and we're not going to do that. We're going to rely on your stirring. And I found that you get the best set when we don't dilute it. This milk is so beautiful. And then, then alternate with big, like, circle okay. eights, you know, figure eights. All right. OK, you're done. While we're waiting for that to set. And it doesn't want to, it doesn't want any bangs or vibrations? No, because you're on the set. It's <gasps> like a good custard, like a souffle. Ah. Uh, exactly. And I can't wait till you put your finger in about 30 minutes and split that curd. The milk that now is. looks and feels like custard. The hand dives in to find out if things have worked out the way they should. And you feel the break. Now what are you feeling for, Mary? When you I'm do feeling that? when I put my finger in there. If it feels totally silky and clear. Can so I do it again? Yeah, do it again. Uh -huh. There's no layers. Yeah. It's just one solid mass. Uh -huh. If I felt layers, then I'd know that the cheese, um, the milk is fragile, and I need to alter the cook and cook it less, because it's going to dry up really fast. It means that it's been damaged. It is right. So it must be cut and cut and cut some more. Bravo, what about that piece in the center? Uh, it'll live. This dictates the quality of your cheese curd. How you cut the curd can destroy or make the cheese. The curd is chopped and broken, and the whey, the watery byproduct, drained off. We're waiting for the moisture to come out of the curds, and then I'd say about the next two to three minutes, we're going to form it up. It's moving along beautifully, so. In forming the wheels, or rounds, Mary uses a prosaic late 20th century tool, the plastic colander. Simple enough. The milk now looks and feels like cottage cheese. Now, this is the funny part. OK, now we're going to put it together in the colander. I like this. I knew this was going to be fun, but I had no idea how much and it is shaped and soon set out on the shelf in one of the caves where nature takes over the process. Mold will flower on the outside, build the rind, and on the inside, flavor the cheese. The silent work of aging and curing. It's one long process of patience and care, of hands and hearts, of wanting to do something right and not merely something for the dollar. Yeah, I think I have uh, late September, early October. Odessa Piper's yeah. restaurant Les Toiles yeah. is over yeah. there on the corner, right by the local farmer's market. A bounty of ingredients just outside the kitchen door. Where else would you expect to find 
Definitely Such a restaurant. Really, market's really rock and rolling today, isn't it? I was thinking about Mary's comments yesterday that artisanality is about pursuit of flavor. And I think I'm just a continuation of what Mary does at her farm. My idea is to make a jewel box of the season. And my plan is to take all these different vegetables and put them into smaller pieces and bake them in a baking parchment, which I fold up. Some of the vegetables, I'm going to pre-cook them ever so slightly. But with all of them, uh, my plan is to make them very, very fine. Uh, because once I get them all assembled in the jewel box, they're only going to take about five minutes to finish cooking. So that's how I'll prepare the pepper strips. Now what I have here are all different colored carrots. These vegetables will be blanched. I have this wonderful Romanesco. And because the, the little spires are just so amazingly beautiful and special, I'm cutting from underneath so that I can get their shapes. Here is a really fun cauliflower. We're going for beautiful little bite-sized pieces. I think we'll need a, a little bit of um, what I call mother flavor. That would include onions and shallots or scallions, chives. Just a little bit of leek I think would be a very nice touch. And everyone uses the white part of the leek, but I'm fondest most of the transitional part when it goes from white to green. I also got some uh, Beauty Heart radishes. This will be quite a fun surprise, too. They taste like a radish. They are very firm and peppery. So I'm going to take the vegetables that I prepared so far, the different colored carrots, the beautiful purple cauliflower, the Romanescos, the Beauty Hearts. All I want to do is take their raw flavor off and uh, render them to where they are a bit, they give a bit of resistance to the tooth. That's what al dente means, a little, a little tooth feel. They are going to continue to bake when I put them all together in my vegetable jewel box. I'm going to just put a little bit of oil down on the base and cut some zucchinis. I'll add our pepper strips back in. And I'm going to season these a bit with pepper and with a little bit of salt. Now, I highly recommend using kosher salt. I'm going to now be very careful with setting out my vegetables to create a very organized uh, amount of, of thickness. I don't want any one part of the parchment to be too thick. So I have my base. And now I'm going to put a happy, colorful little handful of these vegetables on. I want a sweet element. It's called the ground cherry. And it's a beautiful little yellow fruit that grows on a vine. And they have a wonderful flavor. Now, Everything about this little package of vegetables is about this season, this region, this farmer's market, this relationship between this farmer and this chef. And if you're going to do your own version at home, I could suggest if you can't find ground cherries that you select another fruit. And a very good one would be an apple. I have a little bit of late season basil that I'm going to use in Italian parsley. I'm also going to use a little bit of chive as well to finish things off. More of the grapeseed oil. This lemon juice is just added at the last minute. I'm going to fold it over where I take it at the joined end, not the open end. I'm just folding it in on itself. And what it's doing is it's trapping all those delicious seasonings and oils and juices and goodies. So now my jewel box is locked. This now I'm going to put in the oven. I'm going to bake it at 400 degrees, and we'll check it at five minutes. Mm. This 
this is our autumn jewel box of seasonal vegetables. This next sequence, what I'm gonna do is cheeses. We've got the cow's milk cheese that we were making um, yesterday out at her farm. And here's our beautiful little sheep's milk cheese, which is one of the signature cheeses of their farm. But I think we should build our cheese plate around the, uh, the Gabrielson Lake, which we made yesterday. The ingredients that I think are really good with the cheese are toasted nuts and a little bit of acidity coming from fruit. It makes a nice foil for the cheese. And I'm actually going to take some of these pears and get a little more going with the acidity by poaching them in Riesling wine. While that's poaching, I'll open up these cheeses. This is a really beautiful example of her Gabrielson Lake. Now, Mary explained to us that these rinds, though they look a little bit like they are take no prisoner, are actually quite edible and quite delicious. They're very nutty on the outside. So to complement that nuttiness, I'm going to actually take some of my favorite nuts and put them alongside. I can't resist. Mary's Trade Lake Cedar is her signature sheep's milk cheese, and she sent along a loaf with us, and I think we have to open it up and check it out. It's interesting to note the differences in aroma are profound. The sheep's milk cheese smells sweeter and more, if it was like an orchestra, it would be the music that they play at the fast part. And this cow's milk cheese has lower tones, sort of like how a cow will moo. It's, it's, it's also sweet, but I would describe it as much more nutty. They both have a very pleasant acidity that I can even smell. And it's that acidity that we love to celebrate in these great cheeses. So I've taken my pears, which are poached now, just because the shapes are so beautiful. I'll give it a couple simple swipes and center the cheese. Maybe I'll put that little fresh cheese sort of in the middle to make a little bouquet. And I can't resist it since we've got a lot of blonde colors here. Uh, I'm going to give some honeysuckle and other blossoms to finish our plate. This is what we would bring out after the main course has been served and finished. And it's often the case that dinner is so delightful, the guests are so relaxed, that we want to continue on a little bit before it's time for dessert. Not everyone does this, makes a life work apart from modern day packaging, additives, hormones. What Grant Burdick, the Fox, and Odessa Piper do for a living would fit easily into a society several millennia back.